we are going to start today, um, season three, episode four, and I titled it your ego or your Christ. And, uh, today we're going to be talking about marriage, (laughs) Uh, but we won't get too deep into the whole conversation because, um, I want to start our don't play games series season two in fall 2021. So I'm going to, you know, save our content for relationships and marriage and all that. I'm going to save all the good stuff for uh, that series later on in the fall, which I want you to go crazy, um, which um, because we're going to be opening in the fall and that's when everybody starts coming back to the rhythm of life and people start settling down a little bit more. And uh, we want to use this series as a way to invest in you, but also in as a way for people to actually feel attracted to coming to here because everybody loves talking about relationships. I don't know what it is. Everybody's just so, I mean, so in love and we're just so passionate about, you know, finding the one and, you know, finding true love. So I can't wait for this series. It's going to be super good. So I'm going to save a lot of my content for that. But today we're going to start with a very interesting verse that I think that a lot of people would want to tune out the moment that they actually hear the second word of this verse. Last week we ended in Colossians chapter three, verse 17. Today, we're picking it up in verse 18. And please don't tune out when you hear the second word. Okay? All right. I'm going to pray before we read this verse. Father, help us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 says this. Wives, first word, submit. Don't tune me out, okay? And plus, I didn't write this, all right? This is all God. (laughs) And, and this is where we landed today. And in 2021, as a young pastor, that you don't want to read these verses because the word submit has very negative connotations to it. But let's let's tune in, tune in, tune in. Don't 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 disengage just right away. Don't don't disconnect. Just just give me give me a chance, okay? Yes. Wives, submit to your husbands in a way that is appropriate in the Lord. Mm-hmm. And that's where we're gonna park for a few minutes. <laughs> My first point is defining submission. A lot of people see submission as a nasty word, and it's because they don't have the right understanding of this word. We ignore what it means. Therefore, we read a verse like the one that we just read, and we automatically tune out and disconnect. Mm. And it's because we ignore what the actual context and the content of this passage has to offer for us. Mm. So I want us to break it down. Mm. The word submit in the Greek, which is the original language that this verse was written, is the word hupatasso. And hupatasso means to arrange under an orderly manner. Mm. That's it. Some synonyms to the English word submit are words like acknowledge, agree, cooperate, help, follow. Mm. Antonyms to this word submit would be words like contradict, refuse, deny, fight, reject, and resist. So when you read it with the proper understanding, when you read it with the proper context, when you read it with the proper definitions, you end up realizing that, of course, Paul is going to write to submit because no one would advise you to contradict, (laughs) refuse, deny, fight, reject and resist your husband. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's true. Yeah. Uh-huh. And because our English language is so limited, this was the one word that we could use to translate it from the Greek. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you actually find and define the words, even in the English language, what Paul is essentially saying is, Hey, acknowledge, agree, cooperate, help follow. Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't we want to agree and cooperate That's good. and help? the person that God brings to you as your spouse. To me, when I break it down, it makes perfect sense. Mm. It's good advice. And for all of you that have been married, I think you would understand that cooperation is a very powerful, good key in order to have a successful marriage. And if you are a child with parents that fight all the time, that don't help each other out, you can kind of puzzle it together and piece it all together and realize that the advice that is given is actually good advice in order to bring peace to a home. Yeah, that's yeah. True. So when you break it down, essentially, Paul's just saying, hey, as a wife, you want to acknowledge your husband's leadership. Agree. You want to cooperate, not contradict it, refuse it, deny it, fight it, 
and resist it. That would be bad advice. So just because the word has been, I guess, translated into a, interpreted into a nasty word in our culture, it doesn't mean that what was written in Colossians chapter three, verse 18 is bad. Mm-hmm. We just have twisted the meaning of this word. We have destroyed the beauty of this word mm-hmm. without even understanding it. We refuse it. Mm-hmm. Wow. But when you break it down, you kind of understand that that's not such a bad word. Yeah. We've just made it nasty in our culture. And the truth is that when you actually define it and you come out of your ignorance, you can kind of piece it together and be like, that's not that bad after all. Mm-hmm. Point number two, understanding submission. The first thing that you need to understand when it comes to this verse is this, that it's not a cultural thing. Yeah. This is a command of God. Yeah, yeah. It's not an old Jewish custom. It's 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 because a lot of people go like, well, you read that verse and the Bible's antiquated and it's old school. And, you know, we bring these terms old school, new school, modern, progressive. Mm. But what you got to understand is this, that this is God's word. God's word is eternal. Yeah. God is not trying to fit into culture. Uh-huh. Come on. Come on. That's why this first point when it comes to understanding submission is that you have to comprehend it's not a cultural thing from old Jewish people. Mm-hmm. This is a timeless advice. This is timeless wisdom yeah. that as long as marriage exists, yeah. this principle stands to be true. The second thing that you have to understand is that it's not an absolute thing. So it's not a cultural thing and it's not an absolute thing. What does that mean? It means that a widow can't do this. Mm. Neither can a divorced woman. This also means that a woman whose husband isn't mentally sober, she can't do this either. Mm. And definitely a woman with a cruel and abusive and evil husband can't and shouldn't do this. Safety comes first. So when we think of the word submit, we think of the word slavery. And if the husband is abusive and if the husband is violent and he's physical, we think that the Bible is unfair, but you got to understand that it's not an absolute thing that there are certain cases where this principle should not be applied. It is wisdom, but it is wisdom under the frame of a godly marriage. And here's the third thing that you have to understand when it comes to submission, that it's a choice thing. Mm. It's a choice thing. A wife can't be forced into submission. If you have to force your wife into submission, it's no longer submission. It's like a humble person saying they're humble. They're no longer humble. A wife has to give her submission to her husband as a gift. It's a gift that she gives to him. It's a gift that she's willing to give and offer to her husband. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to offer you my submission. I'm, I'm willing to come under your leadership. I'm willing for you to be my protector. And submission isn't a competency issue. It's a faith issue. Because of a wife's faith, a Christian woman gives freely the leadership role in the marriage to her husband. But the truth is though, we submit all the time. When you live at a home, we're submitted to the authorities of that home. When we're in school, we're submitted to the authorities of that facility and its faculty. Then there are deeper things that we submit to like alcohol or drugs or a bad habit or anything that has a grasp on our minds strong enough to lead our choices and make us yield to its purpose. So you practice submission, you just don't know it. You practice submission, it's just not sometimes under the context of marriage, but we all practice submission one way or another. So when it comes to an ideal marriage under God's will, We're talking about an ideal marriage under God's direction, under God's will. This is the ideal way to practice submission. When we're talking, when it comes to marriage that is under God's will, why would it be a bad thing for a wife to acknowledge, agree, follow, or give way to a loving husband? Why would that have to be such a nasty thing to do? It's not a nasty thing to do. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful gift to offer out of choice. Wow, that's good. Because submission cannot be forced. Submission cannot be imposed. Submission is always relational. 
So what would submission look like? What does submission look like? Well, as a wife, you receive your husband's leadership. And I say receive because you can reject it. You can reject his leadership. But if you want to practice this beautiful principle, which is a beautiful principle, it's wisdom from heaven. If you want to practice it as a wife, you first have to receive your leadership. You first have to receive your husband's leadership. Even though marriage is teamwork, it's the husband that God holds accountable and responsible for whatever happens in that marriage. So I want to read the same verse, Colossians 3.18, from the Message Bible. Listen to how the Message puts it. Wives, be subject to your husbands out of respect for their position as protector and their accountability to God. The husband is accountable. It's, it's the husband who God holds responsible. But what happens when the husband doesn't want to assume his responsibilities? <laughs> this is where the wife needs to confront the husband with love and respect. You know, if you are a wife that has known your husband, you kind of know how to lead him. You kind of know how to sway him. You kind of know how to influence him. You don't want to be manipulative. But you have ways because you know him. You know his ways, so you have your ways to have your way. <laughs> and so as a wife, when your husband doesn't really want to assume his responsibilities or he's having a season where it's difficult to assume his responsibilities, this is where you're going to have to confront your husband, but in a respectful and in a loving way. And there are two powerful weapons that a wife holds. And the first one is prayer for God to deal with his heart. Amen. Prayers to deal with God's prayer, for God to deal with your husband's heart. You, you, you can pray and say, God, in the name of Jesus, make this man pick up the broom once a week at least. Convict his heart, Lord God. Tell him to talk to the kids, Lord God. <laughs> and you can speak to the Lord, and, and it's the Lord that transforms the heart. The other weapon that I think that is a powerful one is the appreciation for what he gets right. Mm. Wow. Mm. Appreciating what he does right. Mm -hmm. You know, as a man, we like to be told that we're doing things well. Hey. Uh. We like a compliment once in a while. <laughs> we like it when we are affirmed of our masculinity. Amen. We like it when we're affirmed with our abilities. Amen. We're, we, we, we feel better. You, you, you gas us up. And there's nothing better than having... The wife that God has given you, who knows all your weaknesses, right? Who knows all your shortcomings, who knows who you really are in private. There's nothing better than for that person to be like, you're, you're amazing. You know that you're so, you're just so manly. You're so, man, you, you, the way you pick up that trash bag, it's just, mm. it's, it's, it's appreciation for the things that see prayer and appreciation for the things that he gets right. It moves mountains. <laughs> and so some of you women who are married and all of you that are not married, I'm, I'm giving you good tips today. Yes, thank you. Thanks, master. What does submission look like? As a wife, you receive your husband's leadership. Gas him up a little bit. Pump him up a little bit. Number two, genuinely be your husband's best friend. Yes. In order for submission to be pleasant and palatable, we're going to need to be friends first. Friends first, not friends with benefits first. That's why you need to get to know each other deeply. Someone say deeply. deeply. Get to know each other deeply. Build memories. Good ones. Have fun together. Share meaningful moments. So for those of you who aren't married, you need to get to know each other profoundly before you get married, before you have sex. Because the moment sex appears without friendship, first beautiful things will disappear. A lot of people, young people, before they get married, what's the first thing they do? They hook up and then they shack up. And then what happens after that? They break up. Because anytime that you put sex before friendship, Beautiful things disappear. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And for those of you that are married, I'm so sure that at the beginning of your guys' relationship, you guys did have fun moments together. Mm -hmm. 
And so in order for submission to be pleasant, yeah, all of that that you guys used to do before you guys got married needs to be rekindled. Like wifey, you need to, you know, pursue your husband. Husband, you need to pursue your wife. You guys need to tease each other. Go on a romantic date at least once a week. Take a vacation for honeymoon part two or three, wherever you guys are at in your marriage. Tease a little. Rekindle the fire all over again. Because in order for submission to be pleasant and palatable, you guys need to be best friends. Yes. For all of you single people that are, you know, make up most of our church, um, you really have to think about the future because anytime that you give into sex, you're destroying your future. Yes. Wow. That's right. it's true. Anytime that you give into sex in the present, you're throwing away your future. That's true. Because I really want you to stick to this piece of advice. Once sex appears before marriage, yeah. beautiful things will disappear after marriage. Stick to that line. Come on, yeah. come on. When you're in that heated moment on a car ride home <laughs> or after the movie date <laughs> or when you guys are texting and sending yourselves <laughs> nice text messages. <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. Right. When sex appears before a friendship, beautiful things disappear after marriage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Number three, and this is a very important one. Mm -hmm. how, how does submission look like? Number three, you protect your husband's heart. Mm. Yeah. It's obvious that a woman's words can really damage a man's heart. But what's interesting is to see how many wives tend to forget that. And what's even more interesting is when a wife degrades, emasculates, humiliates, belittles, and insults her husband and expects that to result in him loving her better. When, when, when you give attitude to your husband and you emasculate him with words, when, 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 when you humiliate your husband and you degrade his capacity, oh, you're so good for nothing. Look at Sally's husband. He's a real man. You're, you're completely destroying his confidence and self-esteem. And the worst part is, why doesn't he love me? Uh, that's true. Yeah. Maybe it's your mouth, Susie. Oh. <laughs> it's, 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 it's very important. In order for submission to look like something pleasant, yeah. you receive his leadership. Wow. You become his genuine best friend. Yeah. And you protect his heart. That means that you got to be careful with all your emotions because your emotions can lead you to say sharp things. Mm -hmm. You'll cut them up. Yeah. You'll cut them up. Yeah. And it leads to having submission become a nasty thing. Wow. Mm -hmm. that's true. So that's for the women, now for the men. Oh, come on. All right, yes. let's get started. Yes. Verse 19. Husbands, mm -hmm. love your wives Hallelujah. with an affectionate, mm -hmm. sympathetic, Selfless love that always seeks the best for them. And do not be embittered or resentful toward them because of the responsibilities of marriage. The only responsibility sometimes men are looking forward to in marriage is the sex. Then all the other responsibilities, you just want to peace out. I am my head out. Colossians 3.19, the same verse from a different version, puts it a little bit more straight to the point. Husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. Mm, that's good. So how should husbands love their wives? Husbands, you first love your wife sacrificially. Yes. That's good. We must love our wives sacrificially. Young men, when we get married, we must love our wives sacrificially. We don't like sacrifice. We like others sacrificing for us. <laughs> but we don't like sacrificing for others. I'm going to prove that to you in just a few seconds. This means that you can't love her so that you can receive blank in return. Wow. Wow. This means that you just have to love her, period. Come That's why Ephesians 5.25 says the same thing, but it gives us a little bit more specificity on what God wants us to look like when we love our wives. It says, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Good. Next sentence. He gave up his life 
for her. He gave up his life for her. This means that husbands must put themselves in second place. In other words, as husbands, we need to die to self. And we got to put our wives first. Video games, second. Hanging with the boys, second. Golf, second. The business, second. Work, second. All this comes in second place now. Wife is first place. So if you can't put the video games down now, what makes you think that when you're married, you will? Are you exercising that muscle now? Preach. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Number two, cultivate your wife constantly. Yes. How does it look like for us to love our wives? Well, we love her sacrificially. And we cultivate her constantly. That's good. To cultivate means to nourish. That's good. To feed her self-esteem. It means to affirm who she is. In other words, gas her up, bro. (laughs) feed into her strengths strengthen her in her weaknesses make her proud to be who she is be her number one fan make her feel confident when you just look at her look at her see most women fear becoming invisible to their husbands This is why when a husband stops noticing his wife, he is destroying her heart and her desire to love him. That's true. All right, boys, all of us that are not married, how do you treat the most valuable things in your life in the beginning versus later? If we can see that through your commitment, for example, to church. How many of you were super strong and committed and happy when you first started coming to church? And in six months down the line, we don't know where you went. (laughs) You disappeared. God took you or something. Why is that? Because you lack commitment. You lack the understanding of covenant. And if you're going to cultivate your wife constantly... You gotta learn not to depend on what you're feeling. Hey, yeah. That's good. Because sometimes we're so fully invested into something. Sometimes we're so fully invested into a certain thing. And we're doing it because it feels good in the moment. But what happens to your covenant? What happens to your commitment? What happens to your sacrifice when the feelings go down? Are you still standing strong and firm? Because if you're not, this will translate into your marriage. Look, we're so weird sometimes as men. Mm -hmm. We die when we're trying to conquer the girl's heart. (laughs) And she ain't paying attention to us. We're dying. We we, we pray to God and we tell him that we're going through a wilderness experience. And we're dying. And we lose sleep. (laughs) We worry. But it's so weird that six months after you've conquered her heart, you could care less. You could care less. Mm -hmm. That shows you how we sometimes aren't sacrificial. It's like the iPhone illusion, right? Or the iPhone effect. When you first have it, you take care of it. Six months later, man, oh well. You could care less. We can't treat our wives yeah. like iPhones. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yes. They're a soul. Yes. yes. Not a device. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And so if you want to cultivate this woman, that one day you will have the privilege to call her your wife, mm-hmm. you start paying attention to your actions mm-hmm. now. Amen. Now. Are you disciplined? Because cultivating a woman takes discipline. It doesn't take emotions. It takes discipline. It takes loyalty. It takes commitment. Mm -hmm. Do you have that? Mm. And on a side note, which is a footnote, this is a bonus for you. (laughs) 
If you can't cultivate yourself right now, how are you expecting to cultivate your wife one day? What are you doing with your life today? Where are you? Are you taking care of yourself? Do you have plans for your future? Do you seek the Lord to strengthen yourself in Him? To find self-esteem in Him? Not on how many levels you beat in your video game? <laughs> Where does your self-esteem come from? All these things are very important questions for you to start paying attention to because life gets real when you get married. Yes. And a lot of people come into marriage with a fantasy mindset. That's why they have a lot of failure. Yeah. Yeah. So where are you at, young man, with your mind? Are you fully mentally developed? Mm -hmm. Do you have a game plan for your future? Are you being prepared? Are you preparing yourself? Do you know how to cultivate yourself? Are you growing yourself? Are you developing yourself? Are you allowing God to develop grace in your heart? Because wow. if you can't cultivate yourself, you won't cultivate a wife. Yeah. And when kids come, it gets even harder. <laughs> Number three, accept your call to lead. Yes. You got to accept that responsibility. That's good. The one responsible for what happens in a marriage, the one responsible for the climate of the home, for the spirit of the family. That's the husband. Yes. Amen. It's the husband who should be at the forefront of the home. Paving the way for his family. Mm -hmm. Clearing the path. Sacrificing and fighting every day for his wife and children. Wow. Not the other way around. Mm -hmm. In most homes, it's the wife that has to play the mom role and the father role. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. And it's because men have not accepted the call. They have not accepted the responsibility yeah. of their call to lead. Wow. Yeah. Wow. This means that the men need to get off the video games. They need to get off the passivity. That's right. They need to get off the emotional apathy. That's right. This means that the men need to learn how to relate emotionally, wow. communicate verbally, and be engaged spiritually. That's right. How many of you don't communicate? <laughs> you can't even communicate how you're doing today. How are you doing today? Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> how many of you are disengaged spiritually? You don't even know if you believe in God anymore. Oh. Come on. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just trying to expose some of the blind spots that you sometimes walk in with inside your marriage. You walk in with these blind spots, they'll hit you like a semi-truck in a highway. Yeah, right. yeah. Wow. You need to think. Are you emotionally apathetic? I'm not telling you to snap out of it. I'm telling you to grow out of it. Come on, that's good. Yeah. These are things that we must grow out of. These are immaturities that we need to learn how to grow out of conquer these mountains before we step into marriage, have a wife and make some kids. So young men, you have to take your responsibility seriously. Yes. And understand that you're not just going to have sex so that you can, you're not just going to get married so that you can have sex and be a little boy that your wife takes care of. Ooh, yes, yes. You got to get married. Yeah, enjoy the sex, but learn to take the responsibility of what it means to be a leader. Amen. You will be the one responsible for setting the climate, the spiritual climate, the emotional climate. Are you emotionally apathetic? Like, you don't like to feel? You suppress your feelings? You numb it because maybe one day someone told you crying is soft. Wow. Men don't cry. Wow. So then your children grow up with a father that's just equivalent to another piece of furniture in a house. Wow. There's no emotional bank ready to help and provide. Wow. You got to lead emotionally. But if you can't lead yourself emotionally, how do you expect to lead your children and your wife emotionally? And for the married men, I have nothing to say to you other than what the word of God states. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not married and I don't know how to really do it all. And I don't claim to know it all either. Hell no. That would be irresponsible of me. But I can say this based off what a lot of the kids in our church say. A lot of the young adults in our church say. And what a lot of the adults that have been damaged by parents in their previous years Here's what they're saying. 
Men, you're absent. Yes. Yeah. This is true not just for the young men that will one day be fathers. This is true for all the fathers that are listening and watching right now. Mm. That's true. Not all the fathers, the majority of them, correction. Majority. Yeah. And it reminds me of people, of men sometimes, when they grow old and their kids end up having their own families and their kids end up having grandchildren. So the dad goes, why doesn't my son bring my grandchildren to visit me? Because you always reap what you planted. Mm -hmm. yeah. You will harvest what you plant. If, 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 you, if you planted... If you planted absence, you will reap absence. Yeah. If, 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 if you planted emotionally unavailability, you're going to harvest emotional unavailability. Yeah. So if you're a father right now and your daughters and your sons are in their, you know, teen years, maybe their early 20s, you have time to reconcile the years you've lost because your children are going to grow up one day they're going to get married and they're going to have their children and you're going to be an old man wishing to meet and spend time with the grandchildren, but you didn't allocate the time to plant and harvest that. Yeah. Wow. So, men, we're called to lead. We're called to abort this adolescent behavior. Even Young men in their 30s and 40s and in their 50s acting like adolescents because age doesn't matter at this point. What matters is the quality of your character to be present. Hey. Your emotional investment to pull the family together instead of pulling away from your family. Yeah. As men, we must have a vision for our marriages, for our children, for our home. Because we're called to love like Christ loved the church. And this means you assume your responsibility to lead. Amen. 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 You assume your responsibility to lead. Are you leading? Are you leading? Are you leading? Are you, are, are, are you walking towards this? Young men, your daily routine, what is it filled with? Is your daily routine intentional? Because you can't just get married one day and become a leader. <laughs> you, you have to develop that call, that responsibility. So here's my conclusion, and I'm going to read it to you. There are many things that get in the way of marriage. Many. But there's one thing that will keep a wife from submitting to her husband and a husband from loving her like Christ loved the church. And now one thing gets in the way of a lot of things. This thing impedes forgiveness from flourishing. This thing slows down our purpose. This thing kills humility at the root. And this thing hurts more families, churches, businesses, and friendships more than anything else. This thing even has been a destroyer since the beginning of time. Yeah. This thing is your ego. Mm -hmm. If you make your marriage about you, it will be frail and fragile because your ego is not a strong enough infrastructure to sustain two imperfect human beings in one roof. You need something stronger, a better foundation, your Christ. So if you don't have a genuine relationship with God, then this means you're trying to find fulfillment in the things of this world. So when you're trying to find your fulfillment in the things of this world, when it comes to your marriage, this means that you'll end up giving God's resume to your spouse and when your spouse cannot save you, heal you, forgive you, fulfill you, redeem you, your ego will say, your husband, your wife is not good enough for you. And this is where the infrastructure of your marriage collapses. But if you want to have a marriage with hope, it all hangs on you receiving God's grace and having a profound relationship with Christ that makes you whole and complete. It starts with you being whole and complete 
through the grace found in your Christ. You can build your marriage on your Christ, or you can build it on your ego. And your ego will always, your ego will always tell you, this ain't good enough for you. She's not good enough for you. He's not good enough for you. She doesn't look good enough for you. He doesn't look good enough for you. And it'll always be about you and what you can get and what you can receive and what you can benefit from. But when you build your marriage in Christ, when you've realized there's grace to spare for all of your mistakes because of him, it becomes easier to love sacrificially and to submit to one another. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for this message. I pray that this may be something that shapes us for our families. I pray that this may be a word that shapes our mindsets. And I pray that you may silence well-crafted arguments and mental strongholds when it comes to opposing the wisdom of your word. Do not allow culture, Lord God, to steer our minds. I pray that your Holy Spirit may empower this church so that it's your word that steers our minds. Bless the marriages that are in our church. Bless the future marriages that will be happening in our church. Help us become young men that lead. And help us become, Lord God, marriages with wives that are willing to acknowledge, agree, help, so that we could be a beautiful team functioning under the principles of your wisdom, your ways, and your word. Help us with this. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. We say, Amen.